Thank you, Merrill, and good evening, everyone. And we need bankers, Lynn. <laughs> Lynn had two decades of financial service experience focused on improving the customer experience before joining the Beneficial State Bank leadership team in 2019. After coordinating the development of its three year strategic plan to scale the bank's impact. She manages brand, communications, PR, digital marketing capabilities and analytics, and its social media strategy. Her primary focus is on educating partners, stakeholders, and the public around the power they have to hold banks accountable and ensure that these institutions serve the best interests of the communities that deposit their money in them. Boy, do we need to hold banks accountable. Lynn holds an undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley and an MBA from the Haas School of Business. She lives with her family and two precocious pups in the East Bay area near San Francisco. Lynn, over to you. We're anxious to hear from you tonight. Thanks so much, Joe, and I apologize in advance because those precocious pups are right outside my off office door crying because they suffer from abject separation anxiety. So um, I apologize in advance. Hopefully that'll get filtered out of your video, but it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here with you all this evening. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and the discussion that follows the presentation. So with that, if it's okay, I'll just jump right into it. Please do. All right. Wish me luck. Hopefully I can do this um, while also seeing the chat. That's my challenge. I won't be able to see anyone's face. So uh, hopefully at the end, um, Joe, Meryl, and Devin can help me navigate the questions that I missed. So jumping right in, um, Joe already did a great job of introducing me. So I'm gonna skip the first slide and go straight to introducing the bank that I work for. It's called Beneficial State Bank. Uh, we serve Washington, Oregon and California and then whoever else won't take no for an answer at this point. We are a triple bottom line bank, meaning that rather than serving the single bottom line of profits for net revenue and service of shareholders, we serve a balanced triple bottom line of people, planet, and shared prosperity. So rather than aiming to maximize profits, we optimize profits with the aim of allowing us to also serve our two other objectives of supporting our communities and investing in environmental resilience. To support this model, we have a somewhat unique ownership structure. Our charter says that we can only be owned by nonprofit entities that are permanently governed in the public interest. So we're a for-profit bank that is solely owned by nonprofit entities. And this kind of unusual ownership structure helps us ensure that there's no conflict of interest between our mission commitments and our shareholder commitments. In other words, we're not uh, victims of shareholder primacy. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about climate change, the role banks play, the role that they could play, and how the B Corp movement can offer a viable vehicle for banks and businesses to transform their operating model and credibly signal their commitments. And uh, speaking of signaling, we haven't, these aren't all of them, but these are some of our certifications. And when we seek out certifications, we want to make sure that there are teeth, that they're validated, they're confirmed, they're third party certified. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why in a moment. So first, let's answer the question, why is sustainable banking important? Let's do a little exploration by starting with banking 101. How does it really work? A quick refresher for most of us in simplified terms, we all put our money, most of us, uh, into deposit accounts or related products like um, money market accounts or certificates of deposit, CDs. That money um, gets put through the banking system and lent out to people. 
and to businesses. And the bank generates money off that lending. There's a margin there. They pay us for the deposits, but we pay them more for the loans. And the difference between those two is called the net interest margin. And that's usually the lion's share of a typical bank's income. Banks also charge fees and they can make money off investing our deposits in other ways. So you could say that banking is the oldest form of crowdfunding because our deposits are aggregated and then used to fund a lending practice. And depending on the bank and the lending policies, our funds could finance a lot of great things, but they could also fund some not so great things, extractive activities like fracking, drilling, dumping, pipelines, refineries, fossil fuels, and general coal mining, uh, weapons manufacturing, dirty energy, uh, private prisons, and other things that profit from human punishment or suffering. So topic of the day, let's talk about climate change and how much of the problem can we blame on banking? Uh, a lot of times when I try and tell people, wow, banking has this huge connection to climate change, I usually get one of two reactions, either absolutely or what are you talking about? So I'm going to refer to uh, some database sources, namely one I I anticipate many of you are a fan of, which is Rainforest Action Network, who puts out an annual climate chaos report that digs into the data around banking financing of the fossil fuel industry. So Rainforest Action Network asserts that any bank that supports a company that is investing in expanding fossil fuels is actually accountable for driving climate chaos. And their annual report lists the top 60 banks globally in their fossil fuel financing. And just in the last seven years, that financing equated to over $5 trillion. And seven years, because seven years ago, that's when we signed the Paris Climate Accord. So how important really is finance and banking to the fossil fuel industry? A lot of people tell me, well, if banking backed out of fin financing fossil fuels, the industry would just go on. And uh, Rainforest Action Network makes an argument that that's not actually true. So they think about fossil fuel, the entire industry as standing on a stool and a stool has three legs. And the industry, like any company needs three things to support fossil fuel projects. First, they need permits so that they can drill. Second, they need insurance. And third, they need financing or money so that they can run their projects. And you could argue that without insurance, you're not going to get financing. So if you take out any one of these legs of the stool, the entire industry would collapse. Well, in 2021, the UN recognized this and they decided to convene the Net Zero Banking Alliance. They assembled banks from all over the world uh, into this alliance to commit to their 2050 net zero goals. So you'll see in small print here, it says industry-led UN convened. That means that the UN isn't a governing body. They're not a certification body. They don't do any audits. They don't control or dictate how these banks are gonna comply. The banks themselves are leading all that and self-governing. The good news is that a lot of banks have signed on to this net zero commitment by 2050. In fact, so far, the number of banks encompass about 40% of global bank assets. So that's no small feat. So I, I thought this was great news. So I referred back to the latest Rainforest Action Network um, report on banking on cl climate chaos to see. Hi, did someone have a question? I didn't realize how good the flower smells. Mm. Okay. 
So uh, I wanted to cross-reference our Net Zero Banking Alliance members with the Rainforest Action Network's list of top financiers of fossil fuels. Um, so I looked at what they call the Dirty Dozen list, which is the top 12 banks responsible for financing fossil fuels. And I'm looking at the chat. Would anyone like to guess of the top 12, how many of them also signed on to um, the Net Zero Banking Alliance pledge out of 12? 12, and that's my 12. guess. 12, any other guesses? Zero. Zero. We've got a 12 and a zero. No, no one wants to guess anything in between. Well, I went through, it was a pretty long list. Over uh, 140 banks signed on to the Net Zero Banking Alliance pledge. And these are the ones on the Dirty Dozen list that also signed on to the pledge. Interesting, basically all of them, right? But there's a subset of Net Zero Banking Alliance banks I'm sorry, someone has their microphone on and I'm hearing an echo of myself talking. So um, if you could go on mute for just a sec, that would be great. Uh, so then the question is, how many of these banks decided to become signatory banks for net zero, meaning that they didn't just commit to 2050, they actually made a 2030 interim milestone commitment as well. And this includes 129 banks signed on as signatory banks. And so um, punchline, I went through and identified the ones that were also signatory banks. And again, every single one of them made 2030 commitments. And the irony is these are the banks that are perpetuating the fossil fuel industry through their financing today. So back to Rainforest Action Network's fossil fuel finance report. Last year's climate chaos report basically said, it's probably too late at the rate of current production, even without further exploration or net new drilling, we will exceed our one and a half degree warming limit. And then to make matters worse, this year's report is even more dire as they assert that our current fossil fuel infrastructure our current infrastructure without mitigation and reduction in production will exceed our carbon budgets within 20 years. Rainforest Action Network says that the industry that is most to blame will not be the source of the solution, which is the financial services industry. Hey, I'm in it. But we could argue that though the big powerful banks will probably not drive the solution or even be a catalyst for it, they need to be a part of it. And some banks are taking meaningful steps in that direction. One of them is Bank Australia. They're a B Corp. And so hopefully, um, I have a video. Hopefully this will play all right for people. Right now, your money might be invested in projects that go against everything you believe in. Your money might be fueling the climate crisis, supporting animal cruelty, or even aiding addiction. What happens next is up to you. try and get out of that as quickly as possible or it'll play again. But um, Bank of Australia, uh, somewhat unique, but not alone. There are banks like Bank of Australia popping up all over the place. In fact, my bank is one of nine banks in the United States. That is a UN for Principles for Responsible Banking founding signatory a community development financial institution, a member of Global Alliance for Banking on Values, a certified B Corp and committed to climate 
action and or social justice. So this is becoming a trend. We're growing and we're building momentum. A lot of times when I tell people that my bank has a mission and we do good stuff, they compare us to other banks or even credit unions. So I created this banking impact continuum to kind of illustrate uh, where different types of banking business models would fall on this continuum. So one good way to assess a bank's benevolence, and some would argue the way, this is the way Reinforced Action Network does it, is they look at a lending practice. So mainstream banks will lend to pretty much any industry for which they have expertise and for which lending is legal and they won't get shut down or in trouble. These same banks could be very active in communities. They can be sponsoring events. They can be donating to charities. Even some participate in virtue signaling certifications like Net Zero Banking Alliance or 1% for the Planet. But be wary of banks and businesses that make promises based on income, especially net income. Neutral banks and credit unions, a lot of them have a do no harm policy. So maybe they don't participate at all in the fossil fuel industry. Maybe they don't finance semi-automatic weapons. Maybe they don't do coal. Um, and maybe they do great things for the, their communities or their environment, but they don't necessarily have mission impact requirements. Then on the other end of the scale are some of the banks that I was talking about, like Bank of Australia. Not only do they have a do no harm policy, they also have rigorous mission commitments where at least 35% and in some cases over 75% of their lending has to be positive impact. Uh, I mentioned you know, a model for looking at and scrutinizing how banks finance. So a lot of banks will talk about, oh, we donate 5% of our net income to the community, or we donate 1% of revenue for through 1% for the planet. But true impact banks are deploying their capital toward impact purposes. Their capital is their lending underlying structure. It's much greater than their net income, and it's not a token. So the moral of the story here is when a bank makes green claims, always question the denominator. When you talk about, oh, this is what we're doing, ask them what percentage of your capital is being deployed to the environment or to social justice. So the alternative to traditional banking and traditional business is stakeholder capitalism. This is ca where capital is deployed with consideration for all those potentially impacted by the business's actions, including the planet. So for example, Beneficial State Bank manages our underwriting for its lending portfolio to target at least 75% mission impact while ensuring that the remainder of the portfolio is mission aligned with our do no harm policy that prohibits us from lending to any industry that would negate the positive impact that we're making on the other side with our mission impact lending, such as weapons, fossil fuels, and private prisons. And though this banking model may be the exception, as I said before, we're not unique. More and more impact banks are springing up and flourishing with a triple bottom line model that elevates the interests of people and the planet to the same level as profit. But this is complex. Doing this due diligence is a lot to ask of the average consumer. And for a lot of businesses, it's a lot to ask them too to put these kind of governance models in place when they're just trying to break even, much less make a profit and keep the doors open and make payroll. And who has the time or expertise to investigate every single account they open or every product or service that they purchase? Yeah, so I see someone's asking, can you elaborate on what a B Corp is? I will. <laughs> so if banking that practices stakeholder capitalism is the way, then let's talk about what's standing in the way. Why aren't more banks adopting stakeholder capitalism, which is the B Corp movement? Some of the headwinds that we're facing, 
complexity, cost, ambiguity, inconsistency, skepticism. Uh, in the interest of time, since we don't have all night, I'm just going to focus on the last three. So let's talk a little bit about green business for a moment. What exactly does green mean? So the good news about green is that people care. Gen Z is willing to pay more for sustainable products. Climate change is by far millennials' top concern. I think most of us already know this, but what's standing in the way and what's eroding this commitment and this confidence? And I think many can make the business case that one of our biggest headwinds is greenwashing. Greenwashing is a huge issue because it fuels skepticism, it incentivizes inconsistency, and it contributes to ambiguity. Over 40% of Americans believe that when someone says this is green, it means it's beneficial for the planet. But the reality is that only 29% understand them what, when businesses make green claims, it only means that whatever they're offering is a little less bad than whatever the mainstream offering is. Further, companies will talk green but act gray. For example, the net zero examples I gave you for the dirty dozen banks. They'll set far off goals and promises with no real plan, governance, oversight, or um, teeth around achieving them. They'll often amplify their charitable work in the form of marketing and PR when their actual operations are extractive and dwarf what good that they're doing out in our communities and in the planet. They'll make token compromises rather than meaningful changes, and they'll repackage business as usual as business for good. So everybody's going green. I like to interrupt this presentation with a quick quiz. Um, this is an actual social post by a company. Business and sustainability are not separate stories for our company, but different facets of the same story. Uh, in the chat or in the meeting, does anyone want to guess what company said this? This is your chance. Chase. Chase, that's a good guess. Amazon. Shell. Oh, you guys are so close. Coca-Cola. So this was actually, oh, I skipped it. I removed a slide. So I'm gonna go to a little bit more greenwashing here. I have major US bank claims. We do not finance Arctic drilling. We don't finance fracking or tar sands. We don't finance coal-fired power generation. We don't finance big tobacco or palm oil or wood pulp. This sounds like a great bank. When they made these claims though, the Rainforest Action Network, along with the Sierra Club, outed them because their parent company was the biggest financier of offshore oil and gas over the six year period since the Paris Climate Agreement. <laughs> also, what they don't advertise is that they have no restrictions around some other things that we probably don't want them to finance. So I think this is a great example of what you might call greenwashing, but the truth is this bank is much better than mainstream banks at the same time. Oh, and this was the tweet that Coca-Cola posted. I just thought it was so cute. I like to include it in the presentation. So the question is, how do we build credibility in the face of all this potential um, and how do we signal with credibility and rigor that we walk the talk? How do we know when a company's claims are genuine? And how do we rebuild consumer confidence after we've been hit with a tsunami of disillusioning greenwashing? So how do we do it? How can we tell if a business is good? And how can we tell if a bank is good? Well, a lot of people like badges, but there's so many badges. We have some of these. They mean different things to different people. They make people feel good about their consumer choices. I'm gonna make this argument, and this is where we get into answering Merrill's question. Um, 
I'm going to make an argument for this badge right here, the B Corp badge, and tell you a little bit about what that means. So B Lab, it's a nonprofit organization that creates the standards, policies, tools, and programs that are intended to help us shift traditional behavior, culture, and structure the very structural underpinnings of capitalism. Their assertion is that capitalism isn't inherently bad, but the way that we do capitalism is not sustainable. And that's what really needs to change. So the question is, great, we have a model. Is it working? So I'm going to make a business case that I think it's working. So it, B Corps started in 2007. They're very first year of certification, 110 new B Corps were certified. In 2020, that number rose to 3,758. Over 50,000 B Corp assessments have been completed. Actually, this is a year old. I think right now it's over 150,000 B Corp assessments have been completed. And there are now over 6,000 B Corps covering 156 industries. And just last year, there were over 5,000 new B Corp applicants. So I'll talk a little bit about the B Corp model and share with you this video about B Corps. Throughout history, humankind has created a multitude of different economic and social systems. Traditional systems, absolutism, feudalism, communism, capitalism, the list goes on. And while systems are complex, the truth is they were built by people, so they can be changed by people. After all, humanity is interdependent with one another and with the planet. The problem is, this is often forgotten. And short-term gains are prioritized over long-term value. Me over we, now over the future. Inequity over justice, profits over people and planet. Leading to this and this. All of which are negative impacts of our current economic system. But it doesn't have to be this way. We can transform from profiting only the few to benefiting all from concentrating wealth and power to ensuring equity, from extraction to regeneration, and from individualism to interdependence. It is not an unreachable ideal. It is the reality that we, the B Corp movement, are already building. All around the world, we enable companies to improve their social and environmental impact with our standards and tools. We certify and engage businesses that meet these standards. We catalyze public policies that expand businesses' accountability beyond just to shareholders. We steward communities and collective action and amplify the stories of people using business as a force for good. The B Corp movement, led by B Lab and Systema Bay, positively impacts nearly 300,000 workers at over 4,000 companies in over 150 industries and 77 countries. Together, we're transforming the global economy to benefit all people, communities, and the planet. Together, we'll realize our vision of an inclusive, equitable, and regenerative world. Join the movement. So that video is about 18 months old. So when it was made, there were 4,000 B Corps and now there are already over 6,000. The movement is really gaining momentum. And the latest numbers I pulled when I did this presentation were not 300,000, but over 440,000 employees and not 77, but 84 countries across all seven continents comprising 14 global communities. 
So the B Corp movement, it's pretty common and there's probably some brands that you already know that are certified B Corps. In fact, um, even though there are only 6,000 certified B Corps, over 150,000 companies manage their impact by leveraging B Lab's impact assessment model, which is free and available online to all of us at bcorp.com or bcorporation.net actually. Um, and I can share that URL with everyone at the end of the presentation in the chat, if that's helpful. So you yourselves can go check it out and look at the criteria. It's pretty rigorous. Uh, the model itself looks across five different dimensions, though they're evolving the model and in about a year and a half, it's gonna change and be even more rigorous. Today, those five areas are governance, workers, community, environment, and customers. And businesses get a score out of a possible 200. It's pretty hard to pass. Four out of five companies that do complete the assessment do not successfully become B Corp certified. You need a score of at least 80 in order to become a certified B Corp. And if you go to bcorporation.net, you can look up any company, see who is a B Corp, and see for in the spirit of total transparency, see exactly what their score is and how they scored and look up um, the breakdown of that score. Even better, um, they have something called best in the world, or I'm sorry, not best in the world, but best for the world, because it's not a competition, it's a coalition. And to be a best for the world B Corp, you need to score in the top 5% in at least one or more of the assessment categories. Also, once you become a B Corp, you have to take not a declaration of independence, but a declaration of interdependence, meaning that you acknowledge that we are all connected to each other. We are accountable to each other and to the planet on which we all share. So why should we become a B Corp? There are a lot of benefits to becoming a B Corp. It's a tested model. You can use the model even if you don't get your certification. You can still use it to inform governance, sustainable practices, supply chain. Um, you can get special support for smaller companies to become greener, more inclusive, more socially just. It's a rigorous assessment. It's like hiring an expensive consultant, but the model is open source. It's free. For those who are becoming aware of the B Corp logo, when people see it, once you understand it, it builds trust. Uh, B Corps attract more investors. Also, they attract talent. They have greater economic resilience. In the downturn during COVID, B Corps grew up to 28 times faster than mainstream biz businesses of the same size. Also, you get to join a global community of aligned change makers that are committed to the planet and social justice. And if you don't wanna self-direct, there are a lot of consulting firms out there that will hold your hand through the process and help you leverage the model either for incremental improvement or to get your certification. Uh, certification on average takes about six or seven months. Right now, I want to say there's about a nine month waiting list. B Lab is so backed up, they can't hire staff fast enough to meet demand for B Corp certification. And that is my presentation for today. So Fantastic. thank you all for your time. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. What a wonderful introduction. I know we have lots of questions for you. So if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, start with, well, we've got the same question in several different flavors, but let's just start here. In April, you know, all of a month ago, City, uh, B of A, and Wells Fargo had multiple climate proposals on their um, annual meeting agenda. 
every climate proposal from those three banks was voted down by the shareholders of the bank. And the banks, these, these three banks, the number two, three, and four largest US banks, uh, management was told by their shareholders, please continue investing in fossil fuel projects. What can we do given we know how devastating fossil fuel projects are for the climate, what can we do, if anything, to get these banks to, I don't know, see the light, change their, change their behavior? It just seems utterly frustrating when shareholders vote, vote down climate uh, initiatives. Yeah, I think um, the easiest and probably most uh, judicious way for us as individuals or even as a coalition of like-minded people to try to catalyze change is we've got to get to that sort of critical mass, you know, that tipping point. And I think we vote with our, our voices or choices in our dollars, our wallets. We take money out of these banks. We don't get loans from them. We encourage others to do the same. The boards that we sit on, the businesses that we work with and for, we get them to take their money out of these banks. We make a public statement. We expose, we provide visibility and transparency because until it hits these shareholders where it hurts, they're never gonna change. So um, regulation isn't gonna do it because every time we change administrations, that power dynamic changes too. And there's a backlash. So the harder we push from the top, the harder the backlash is from the top. I don't know, does anyone else have any other thoughts on how you might address that? Well, maybe we'll come across some as we go on. Uh, Devin? Well, I, I was going to ask if you could actually put a link to your bank in the chat. Sure. Uh, and I'm going to make it more difficult. Uh, what what would new customers sort of, what should they expect um, when they open an account with you, when you guys? Huh, that's interesting. So we're a, um, a consumer and a business bank, and we are still relatively small. So I think you can expect almost the exact same thing that you would get from a regular regional or consumer community bank. Um, very individualized one-on-one -on -one service. People want to know your name. We have online and mobile banking. I, it's not cutting edge, but we're in the process of investing in more robust infrastructure. So it will be cutting edge within 18 months. Um, but right now it, it's, we have clients that bank with us from Florida, Philadelphia, New York, Venezuela, Ecuador, um, that have decided that we're the bank they want to bank with, and uh, it's working for them. Um, do you have any other specific questions about the bank? Like we pretty much do everything except mortgages and investing. If I wanted to do well, I guess I was going to ask a question about mortgages, but if I wanted to get a loan uh, on a home or a business that has, uh, you know, gas a gas pipeline in it, you know, uh, for for heating and cooling and so forth, um, perhaps a business structure, um, would you fund that, or do you do you go so far as to not fund uh, projects that have fossil fuel? components, I guess, is the question. Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. Um, so up to 25% of our lending portfolio can be toward sort of mainstream lending. So that we don't do uh, owner occupied homes or units of like home homes or structures with four or fewer units because it needs to be technically commercial. Um, we do do some commercial lending. But a majority of our real estate lending, well over 80% is affordable housing or sustainable building. For example, the Bullet Center in uh, Seattle, where we have one of our branches, is uh, 
considered until recently one of the greenest commercial buildings in the world, if not the greenest. It's got over a 300 year lifespan. It's carbon negative, it, composting toilets, that kind of thing. But we do finance um, a lot of low income apartments and condo conversions and low to moderate income subsidized housing that is not green, but it does address um, the problem of home insecurity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Meryl, I'm sorry, uh, Devin? Sure, uh, well, this is kind of along the line. Um, let, let me get to a, 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 an attendee's question. So Robin uh, is curious, how do we combat the oil and gas propaganda campaign, Life Runs on Energy? Uh, these are commercial spots that run on major networks and breaks. Basically, it tells us we can't live without gas and oil products. You know, what, yeah. what a great contribution they make in our lives. Um, and, you know, it's a statement here, but I can't believe this ads these ads run with no backlash. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I don't, even as a marketer, I don't really have a solution for that other than it sounds good. It feels good. They have to say something. Just the fact that they're investing in that kind of PR to me means they're scared and desperate. Uh, so I think a lot of people are going to see it for what it is. Uh, especially younger generations are not going to be fooled by that. Uh, I think it's like milk, it does a body good, or, you know, beef, it's what's for dinner. It's like, if you want to drink milk or eat beef, that's your choice. But most people aren't fooled into thinking it's a substitute for a salad. Very good point, yes. Yeah. Okay. Going back to uh, annual meetings for just a moment, I want to editorialize, if I might, the Chase annual meeting. And Chase is the largest US bank and the largest funder of fossil projects. Uh, the annual meeting coming up is scheduled on May 16th, so all of next week. If you, you or anyone you know uh, is involved with stock, a Chase stock, uh, with, uh, from what the, the research I've done suggests we should vote yes on three proposals. Uh, proposal number six is to phase out fossil fuel funding. Proposal nine is to report on climate transition planning. And proposal 12 is to focus on absolute greenhouse gas reduction goals. Uh, hopefully, the Chase stockholders will do better than the uh, uh, other banks stockholders did. And still with Chase, uh, there are two directors, Linda Bauman and Charles, uh, sorry, James Crown, who are fossil proponents. Vote against them please. So if you are involved in Chase in, in, in any place, uh, again, vote yes on proposals 6, 9, and 12, and against Linda Bauman and James Crown. That's editorializing uh, based on that. Now, if I might just add a, a related question. In 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2020 to 2022, Canada and Japan were the top financers of fossil fuels. Uh, suggest this is from the uh, Banking and Climate Chaos report that you were re referring to. Uh, is there anything we can do to influence uh, Canadian and Japanese banks and others around the world who are uh, also messing up our planet? making greenhouse gas emissions worse? Cool. Uh, I think one big opportunity is to join coalitions that are um, exposing the truth behind banks like Royal Bank of Canada and their financing of pipelines and um, their takeover of indigenous lands. And uh, one of those movements I'll put in the chat that we've been talking to is no more dirty banks. Uh, a lot of 
Hollywood elites have gotten together and decided that they want to uh, use their celebrity to uh, support the movement. And there's so many movements like this. I really think at the end of the day, all we need is for all of them to come together and stop fighting about how and just start focusing on what and why. Maybe we can make you a queen of coming together, leading, <laughs> leading the way to come together or something. <laughs> you, we're all going to need to be in the royal family to make that happen. Yeah. Devin? Sure. Uh, let's see. Jay is asking, are there corporate uh, or university pension funds using the B Corp model? Do the companies who are B Corps also have pension funds set following the B Corp format? I don't believe so because I think if I'm correct that pension funds, um, they can't be benefit corporations. I don't know if anyone knows that for sure. And B Corps are registered benefit corporations. You also can't be a non-for-profit entity, a 5013C or a 5014C and be a B Corp. You have to be a for-profit corporation. So I don't believe so, but I could be wrong. Is there any impact from the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and other regional banks recently on the uh, fossil funding? I mean, Chase has gotten bigger. Absolutely. But... Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. Um, I'll say that, especially with small to medium businesses and businesses in the venture cap space, um, technology firms, and even the common consumer, there's a misperception that the bigger a bank is, the safer it is for your money. And that's sort of a knee jerk reaction to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank. And by the way, I used to work at First Republic. Uh, and it's not the case. And in fact, um, as a lot of people are pulling their money out of smaller regional and community banks and consolidating it in Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, it's what our founder Kat Taylor calls not a flight to safety, but a flight to subsidy. Because if Chase failed, it would destabilize the economy. So of course the government's gonna step in and support Chase. But the truth is that a majority of Americans, over 99% of us, don't have over a quarter of a million dollars in cash sitting in a bank. We just don't. Uh, and even if you did, or your small business did, which is common, uh, there's a lot of investment tools that ensure that you have FDIC insurance up to $50 million in deposits. The other problem with that is when we consolidate our money into the larger banks, over 70% of those deposits don't stay in our communities. They finance loans to large corporations like fossil fuels and private prisons. But when we keep our money in community banks, over 80% of that money on average does stay in our communities and it finances Main Street rather than Wall Street. And the backbone of our economy is built on Main Street, not Wall Street. So this sort of consolidation of deposits in the bigger banks is actually destabilizing our entire economy. And it is concerning. Thank you. Devin? Now, let's see if I can find one. Uh, so this is a question from Allison, uh, and she's curious. Did you happen to read Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Ministry for the Future, which suggests banks are key and describes a whole new kind of currency whose value is based on sustainability? Uh, any, any knowledge or uh, ideas concerning that? I didn't, but I think I have some homework now. <laughs> Ministry for the Future. Is that it? Yes. Fascinating book. <laughs> uh, stepping back from banks just a moment, investment funds that invest in banks, often BlackRock, State Street, 
legal and general and so forth, use funds with the ESG, the environmental, social, and governance labels to go ahead and invest in fossil fuel firms. Uh, there's billions of dollars from these companies, these investment funds in coal, oil, and gas. Is, this is, seems to me to be more greenwashing. Is there anything we can do with respect to these investment funds and what they invest in? Yeah, that's one of those tricky gray areas where it's got a really attractive label on it, but when you pop the hood and say what's actually happening here, I mean, what are, what's the composition of these portfolios? It is pretty disillusioning. Um, it's not my space anymore, so it's a little out of my depth. But what I have seen happening is that um, legitimate funds that provide greater transparency and completely eschew any fossil fuel or coal related investments, including um, like similar or tangential industries like palm oil and refinement and pipelines, uh, when they communicate, if they can gather in coalition, because part of the problem is that, you know, people are going to listen to the most prevalent and the most consistent message, which is why, for example, a lot of people really believe that nuclear is uh, a viable clean energy alternative because the messaging, the PR is so well orchestrated as it is with these ESG funds. Uh, but I think as these smaller funds that are pure and are transparent are coming up, if they can come together and speak with one clear, direct, and consistent voice, people will have something to juxtapose the ESG funds against. And over time, people will be enlightened and they won't be so easily fooled. And ironically, if you've all heard about all this big backlash against like woke capitalism or woke finance, I think that's actually encouraging some of these like sort of middle of the road, greenwashing investment funds uh, and even financial services institutions to retreat a bit from their green claims because the reality is they're playing the center. They don't wanna alienate anybody. And so if they continue with the green claims, they're alienating the right at the expense of trying to, to trick the left into patronizing them. So I think um, it's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a, a bunch of uh, questions coming in. Uh, this one's from our own Merrill. A big argument by many mainstream financial advisors is that traditional investments, uh, i.e. big oil, big ag, et cetera, are more profitable than sustainable, like solar or wind. Uh, how would you reply to these claims? Ooh, um, I am not an energy expert. Uh, so I will say we have an earth services team that does have energy and sustainability experts on it. And we consult with experts like Bill McKibben on some of these things. So I, I think I'm going to have to take the fifth on this one and just say that's a little bit out of my depth. Um, but to answer one of these questions about other banks, I would recommend there's an article that NerdWallet published. I'll, I'll put that in the chat. It lists like the top, I think, 22 um, sort of sustainable, inclusive, benevolent, what they call socially responsible banks in the United States. Uh, and you can see all the different certifications and sort of a, evaluate or assess for yourself which bank is the best fit for you. Thank you. Uh, that, that woman that asked about what are the other eight banks that you recommended, she also asked, um, and that's Melanie, mm -hmm. uh, what does she say? Uh, what is your relationship with aspiration? And that's something that's not clear to me, but uh, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, um, so aspiration, we were a partner of theirs. Um, that partnership is now winding down. They issued a credit card called um, Zero, Aspiration Zero. And their tagline was plant your change. 
so the idea was that you agree to sort of round up your transactions and I think for every few dollars um, they would plant a tree as part of carbon fixation but they came under a lot of scrutiny because you know they would accumulate a lot of these overages from transactions wait till they hit critical mass and then go out somewhere and plant trees and so there's kind of a huge delay but they made it really gratifying because you could sort of see your points accumulating like the trees have been planted when in fact they were waiting for them to be planted there was like a backlog um, and so they've decided to wind down the product. And the reason I know so much about it is because my company is the backbone for that. You have to be a bank in order to service and back a credit card. And that credit card was banked by beneficial state. So we were the servicer for Aspirations product. So in that way, we have been a partner to them. They have another side of their business, which is in um, sort of like um, carbon credits because the part of their business that is working really well is looking at ways that they can fix carbon and help people zero out their footprint for business activities. And so it's highly probable that we'll continue to partner with Aspiration on that side of the business. Perfect. I recently read a book titled The Great Displacement in which the author tours the US and points to places like Norfolk, Virginia, uh, paradise here in California, places in Florida, New Orleans area, and so forth, where we already have had several hundred thousand people uh, just in the US uh, being climate migrants, if you will, uh, just people here. And right. there's a lot of speculation that uh, you know, we might well hit a billion plus by 2050 around the world of climate migrants with sea level rise and fires and the other uh, other phenomenon that the, the climate problem is bringing to us. I understand that, you know, it's impossible to now get insurance in some places like in the Norfolk area, portions of the Norfolk area, simply homeowners insurance. Um, what do you think, what, what do you see this, see the impact of this is in, in banking and, and, and then the finance uh, issue industry going forward? Yeah, I, I'd say from a banking perspective, I think it's a really great illustration of how social justice and climate justice are inextricably intertwined because those who are most economically vulnerable are also those who are most environmentally vulnerable. Uh, and I think it's something to keep in mind when we're thinking about meaningful and enduring solutions that we can't just look at the economics or the environmental dimensions. We have to look at the socioeconomic and environmental variables together and consider that um, and then extrapolate that forward in time and out geographically as well. Uh, and it's a complex problem where uh, I think we have solutions that will help us solve for it, like um, artificial intelligence and data modeling that can run those scenarios and look at what are the socioeconomic and climate implications of like putting a, an energy plant in you know, Gary, Indiana versus Tulsa, Oklahoma, or extrapolating forward on extreme, what were formerly once in a hundred year climate events and how will that impact the Eastern and the Southern seaboards and things like that. Um, I think if you really want to know where we're going and what's going to happen, I would look at insurance companies because their actuaries run those models and they utilize um, artificial intelligence modeling to extrapolate out what their risk exposure is going to be. So for those areas that you can't get insurance anymore, it's because three, five, maybe 10 years from now, 
they might be uninhabitable. And it, it's something to keep in mind because the people who will leave those last are the people who can least afford to leave. And um, I honestly don't know what the solution is, only that we have to keep it on our radar as we're exploring the solutions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of along the same lines. Um, the amount of pure capitalistic profit, oh, this is by Phil, and then I'm gonna add a little bit to it as well. The amount of pure capitalistic profit offered by the fossil fuel industry will continue to drive investment dollars to the big banks to continue enough banks being interested in financing next drilling projects. Uh, how can we overcome that? And then my sort of uh, in, injection there is the, one of the things you mentioned is that the B Corps uh, tend to grow at a 28 times faster rate than regular uh, industries. Uh, any idea why that, why that growth is like that? Um, yeah, so that's a lot there, but if you can answer. <laughs> Okay, maybe I can answer those in reverse order. I might need a reminder what the first question was. Uh, uh, but for the second one, uh, the 28 times that was during the pandemic, that was during the downturn. Uh, and, and so that's, I think, a testament to um, business structure, resilience, and sustainability. So when it's almost like the more rigorous your business management model is, the more resilient you are. And so B Corps, they're extrapolating out. They're thinking about what's in the best interest of our stakeholders, not just our shareholders and investors. What's in the best interests of our employees? Um, what's in the best interests of our communities? They're designing products and services that are intended to have a positive mm -hmm. impact. So when things get bad and you have to choose between, you know, the company that's just out to make a buck and the company that's out to make a difference, people are gonna choose the company that's out to make a difference, both as an employer and as um, a business they wanna patronize. And I think that's gonna become the, be the case more and more. And then um, can you remind me the other question? Well, and that, that sort of answers that question. The amount of pure capitalistic profit offered by the fossil fuel industry uh, is driving investment dollars to the big banks. Um, how do we, how, how is that over, you know, it, can we overcome that or can that be overcome? Uh, well, I sure hope so, or, or there's no future for humanity or the planet, right? <laughs> Um, so that's what we're all betting on, that it can be overcome. I think that it just has to lose, to be honest. And this is just my personal opinion, not the opinion of the, the company I work for, to my knowledge. But uh, I think when we look at what we're on the precipice of with clean energy alternatives, for example, um, innovations in the solar energy space, to have to cut the cost of solar panels by 80% while also quadrupling their efficiency. If we were able to do that, you could, almost anyone would be able to slap four panels on the roof and be go off the grid. You know, companies would be able to self-supply their own energy. And then um, with more efficient storage, you would need very little sun exposure in order to support that. So all these people who are like, oh, it's overcast in Seattle. That wouldn't make a difference if we quadrupled the efficiency of the panels and improved our storage capabilities. Um, and so I think clean energy innovation is probably gonna be one of the key levers we're gonna need to invest in and pull in order to compete. Because if we can get to the point where you just can't make a business case for dirty energy and unsustainable extraction, then no one's gonna invest in it. Indeed. Some of us uh, on the call have participated in, in the third act and Bill McKibben's protests uh, organized against some of these, some of the large, the four large banks and the like. I don't know if we had any real impact, but um, you know, any lasting impact. But what are the one or two top things you 
you think we could do as individuals to, to have an impact here and all the things we've been talking about? I, gosh, that's a good one. I'm torn because one of the, the struggles I have is that there's so much we can do and so much we can say, and it's tempting to do it all and say it all. But if we all got together and just picked one thing we were going to do and one thing we were going to say and use that as a stepping stone and then pick the next thing and then pick the next thing, I would say, let's come together in coalition and speak with one strong, loud voice and take one strong, meaningful action. I think that'll be um, more powerful because, you know, they say you go fast alone, but we go far together. And I think we could go further if we just join forces and pick a battle, even if it individually it's not our top battle. Let's just pick a battle together and fight it together. Thanks. It's good advice. Yeah, that would be a great place to end the, the meeting if you don't. Okay. It, don't would. Want to it would. Uh, we can vote on which what the thing is we're going to pick, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, there are a few more questions, uh, and this is, uh, you know, it feels weird to me to ask, you know, we're, we're sort of trained to not talk about money, but this is a banking sort of, uh, so from Allison, do investors in B Corp banks need to expect lower returns or higher risk? Actually, um, because B Corps tend to have a higher return on investment, historically, uh, B Corps have an easier time attracting investment dollars. So uh, I can't speak to the risk piece, uh, but I think because the business models are so rigorous with so much governance and oversight from the B Corp certification, the B Impact certification model, um, and business sustainability and integrity is a part of that assessment model. Uh, I'd imagine that the risk would be lower, even though the returns are higher. My uh, final, not question, but comment tonight is uh, our uh, financial uh, accountant in North County Climate Change Alliance uh, found Beneficial State Bank some time back and we moved the NCCCA accounts to your bank. So uh, thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, well, thank you for aligning your money with your values. If there are no other questions, I'd actually like to introduce Leslie Gomez, who is the NCCCA treasurer. And she might have a few words to say about uh, our experience so far with Beneficial. Meryl, Leslie? Meryl, we also have a couple of hands raised from Robin and Suzanne. We okay, well, why don't we why don't we bring them in as well? But let's go to Leslie now if she's available. Thank you, thank you, Meryl. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say it was uh, uh, strange, you know, having to swap banks in the middle of uh, our existence and. Uh, that I have found Beneficial State Bank to be just awesome. Anytime that uh, we've encountered any kind of a hiccup, we've been able to contact and talk to a banker at the bank and get any issues resolved. And um, I look at the, what I track what's going on on our bank statements probably a couple of times a month. And I keep a separate log to uh, divide out all of our expenses, but I, I want to thank you, Lynn, for coming and speaking and uh, give you a, a thumbs up on the way your bank operates. Thank you so much, Leslie. That means a lot. Robin, we get to Robin's question. Hi, um, thank you so much. I just really uh, love that you said, uh, you know, people are buying that nuclear because of the propaganda is is a solution and i know the reasons why it isn't but how do you um you know since you're so clear about that how 
how do you speak to people who say it's the solution? What's what's your answer to that? I kind of, oh, I don't know if I should say this publicly. Um, <laughs> um, I Don Draper them. If you don't like what people are saying, you change the conversation. So I challenge them. I say, so the message you're hearing about nuclear being a viable clean energy solution, is that message easy to understand? And they usually say, yeah. Is it simple and direct? Yes. Is it consistent? Yes. Is it pervasive everywhere you go? Are you hearing the same message? Yes. And then I say that's called good PR. And that's all I say. As a, a comment to that, Mark Jacobson, the prof Stanford professor, recently published a new book called No Miracles Needed. And there is about a 15 page section in that book in which he takes nuclear apart. I mean, just. Oh, I need you know, to write this down again. What is it now? No miracles needed. Mark, no miracles needed. Yeah, Mark, Mark Jacobson from Stanford, Mark C. Jacobson. In those 15 pages, anybody who reads those and thinks we should go to nuclear, you know, is, is blind or something. Joe, can you copy uh, Oliver Stone on that one? Ah, uh, boy, does he need it. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Meryl, you got that right. And Bill Gates, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Bill Gates too, right? Absolutely. Suzanne? Oh, we waited too long. Colleen, Suzanne, you, hi. there she is. <laughs> hi, hi, everybody. Hi, um, awesome presentation. So I put something into the chat about um, divestment, about 252, Senate bill. And so, and I'll put in another, this is from our website, Clean Earth for Kids. Hold on. There we go. Um, so sorry, there's a lot in between. I just didn't, you know, anyway. So <clears throat> we have a lot of things on our website. We're working on supporting about between 70 and 80 bills throughout the US. Um, I have a link for that as well. But um, 252 divests over $14 billion from CalSTRS and CalPERS. CalSTRS is the state teacher's retirement and CalPERS is the public employees. And so we've been working on this for so long, right? And so finally, um, finally, um, Gonzalez in California, she, Senator Gonzalez, she took this on and um, it's going through a, like a different process where um, they would be required to do this if this, if this bill passes. Unfortunately, SB 252 to divest CalSTRS and CalPERS is stuck in suspense. And that, as you guys know, suspense means it's just it's like in, it's in jail, right? It can't, it can't move out of suspense until we call and ask for this bill to be pulled out of suspense. And if it is pulled out of suspense, then we can hear it on the 18th. And when we hear it on the 18th, because it doesn't have a time yet or the phone number yet, we, I can't share that with you yet because it's still in suspense. But we'll have that on our website on actions you can take and also on our bills page on Clearance for Kids. Anyway, and so you call in and then you just support that at the at the appropriations um, hearing on the 18th if we can get it out of suspense. So I put two th things into the chat, one from Fossil Free California. They've done an awesome job to divest. And then, you know, ours from Cleaners for Kids. And I'll also put a link, um, if I can do it before we and before we leave, um, to um, the bills that we're supporting. And many of those are climate related. If you scroll down to like team one and you can see um, the kinds of things that we're doing. So we would love your help. We would love your support um, on these on these bills and um, making phone calls and sending emails and postcards and things like that as well. So um, I'll put a link to our website, um, cleanearthforkids.org in here. Um, we met with, um, and big shout out to Jim Wong, our climate consultant 
um, who helped us um, craft a couple of these letters that are very technical um, in terms of climate finance and how we want to hold corporations um, accountable. And also, of course, thank you to Joe Hood for all of his expertise and, and everyone here. Thank you for being so amazing and Jay for serving on our board and Elizabeth and Suzanne for all the calls and stuff they do for North County Climate Change Alliance and all that you guys all do. You're all amazing. So, and I'll put that into the chat, but that would just be amazing because we'd be able to divest, you know, over $14 billion. And our letter hasn't gone out yet. The interns are, interns are still working on it. It's up to 200 footnotes um, why we need to divest. So it's over 10, maybe 12 pages now, um, but that will be available on our website as well. Um, you can click on it. Um, it'll be posted next to the bills. They're just not finished with it. Um, Casey told me she thinks um, Saturday they'll be fin finished with that. But anyway, so I'll um, I'll put a link to our website about bills. Um, here we've got California bills, and then we have our other bills for just like the U.S. Um, that we are supporting, and just um, so grateful to everyone here. Thank you Terrific. so much. Thank, Thank you, Suzanne. Daryl, why don't you uh, take it to to close? Yes, as Marion Cedio, our venerable secretary of the NCCCA is not with us tonight, I will be doing the honors to thank you. And I do want to thank you, Lynn, for the fantastic work that you're doing and for a really great presentation tonight. And so the NCCCA has dedicated the following tree in your honor and planted with your name at a national forest which is chosen based on greatest need e.g burn down etc you can track your tree online through the trees for change website or visit it in person anytime thank you so much uh, thank you it's been an honor sure appreciate you being here thank you lynn Thank yes. you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Lynn. Good night.